Hello and welcome to season two of the Minecraft Ooh. Prehistoric Aquarium. Oh my god, it sounds so good to say that. So, if you're new to the channel, let me just fill you in. This is the Prehistoric Nature mod Ooh. for Minecraft, which lets you travel back in time and interact with plants and animals from throughout geologic history. And what I really love about it is that it's not just the super obvious generic stuff. The developers of this mod have included a lot of really obscure creatures, including some of the fossils that me and my friends actually work on as real paleontologists. So seeing fossils that you work on brought to life in a game that you love is just unbeatable. It's fantastic. And last year, we began working on this huge aquarium. Everything you see here is roughly organized. We have vertebrates on one side, invertebrates on the other, and people really loved it. Unfortunately, I had to take some time off, but now I'm back. And for this season, I'm gonna try and focus a little bit more, not just kind of plonking things down, really thinking about what is it that I wanna get across. And so for this mini story of season two, we're gonna be really challenging the definition of aquarium because we have now reached the Permian, and this is a time when land-dwelling tetrapods really came into their own. So we're going to slowly have to turn this into a bit of a petting zoo, I suppose. Um, let me show you what I mean. So welcome to the Permian. We're in the last era before the dinosaurs were about 270 million years in the past. And yeah, at this time, all of the Earth's continents are stuck together, creating a supercontinent, which we call Pangaea and some exceptionally bizarre creatures roam the Earth, 96% of which are actually about to die, because the Permian of course ends with, well, the biggest mass extinction that we know of. And normally in this series, like I said, I'd plonk animals into their new home, give you a fun fact and call it a day, but whilst a lot of people might be familiar with things like Dimetrodon and Scudosaurus, a lot of people, including myself, sometimes struggle to understand where these animals fit in our own evolutionary story. Like, physically, what are they in the grand scheme of things? So, we're going to go back to the prehistoric aquarium, and over the next couple of episodes, we're going to try and make sense of this weird life in the Permian, and understand where they fit in our big old tree of life. And of course, we're going to start off once again with our Sarcopterygians, our lobe-finned fish. I have on fish. We're going to have to talk about fish. I'm so sorry. And funnily enough, the latest update has actually added two extremely iconic lobe finned fishes. First we have Coelacanthus, this is an extinct type of coelacanth. Coelacanth's obviously made famous for suddenly turning out not to be completely extinct in the 1930s. You can see they've recreated its very iconic tail here, it's, they've done a fantastic job. But even more famous than coelacanths, we now have Eustonepteron, which has for years been the prime candidate for the lobe finned fish that every tetrapod, so that's every amphibian, reptile, bird and mammal, descended from, as it was these lobe-like fins that eventually evolved into the first limbs of early tetrapods. So things like Tiktaalik, and if we go up here, our friend Ichthyostega. These disgusting little goblins, now responsible for every problem in the world, transitioned from life in the water during the Devonian to semi-aquatic amphibious life for the most of the Carboniferous, and eventually into full-time land dwellers in time for the Permian. And just looking at the skull shape of fishes like Eustonepteron and early tetrapods like Ichthyostega, you can so instantly see the similarities. But then there's also interesting changes too. So this part of the skull here, it's called the pectoral girdle. It's where the pectoral fins sort of attach. If you start using your pectoral fins to walk on land, every impact of every step is literally going right to your head, which is not ideal. So over time, we start to see this pectoral girdle start to detach and become more robust and better reinforced. And that's just one of the many adaptations that they're slowly making. But it's also really important to bear in mind that animals like Ichthyostega, they're not evolving limbs in order to drag themselves out of the water. That's not how evolution works. They've evolved these adaptations to improve their movement underwater, and it just so happens that the same adaptations that they've already made are allowing them to visit dry land, in the same way that invertebrates that used to live on the ocean floor with their already functioning legs are able to adapt to dry land very easily. Always keep that in mind. Evolution is never a conscious decision. It doesn't plan ahead. And yeah, like I just said, vertebrates were not the first animals to leave the ocean. As we showed in the last series, invertebrates had already done it about 70 million years prior, and of course plants and fungi managed it 50 million years before they did, so in a way vertebrates were kind of behind. It was an invertebrate world that they were entering. So anyway, these early Carboniferous amphibians included groups like the Temnospondyli, of which we already have one member here, the sneaky Amphibamus, so that so far is the only animal that's managed to escape its pen in the entire aquarium. 
However, we can now add some new Temnus Bundle Eyes. So for instance, we have Eriops, a monster amphibian from the swamps of Permian, Texas. It has these awesome curled fangs, which oh, just, looks, just looks wonderful. We also have the delightfully named Acanthostomatops, which has this ridiculously wide skull. A lot of early tetrapods tend to have wide skulls, and I think it's believed to be a part of their gradual adaptation to breathing oxygen out of the air instead of from water. Like these big wide jaws help them take, you know, big gulps of air back in those early days. We also have Prionosuchus, um, and it's <laughs> it's going quite crazy. Oh my god, it's eating everything! Oh my god! Uh, okay, it's on a rampage. One second. Just gonna like airlift <laughs> this out of here for now. Oh my god, I hit. I, I, oh my god! I think we're gonna move our Tully monsters over here and then we'll use this spot for Prinosuchus because it is a monster. So, as its name Sukus suggests, it is very crocodile-like. It has this super elongated body, a long snout, sharp teeth. With all those features, it's reasonable to assume they would have behaved quite similar to living crocodiles. And also, we kind of shouldn't be surprised by this. This pointed, elongate body is perfect for swimming quickly. It's why, throughout geological history, reptiles, mammals, and birds have all independently converged on this body shape again and again, because it just works. Speaking of convergent evolution, we also have Platyhysterex, which looks a hell of a lot like Dimetrodon, looks very familiar. Um, but this is still a Temnus Bundelai amphibian, its fossil record isn't great, but we do have bits of the sail, which, again, this feature, adapting the neural spines, that's the part of the vertebrae that forms this uh, sail, it's evolved independently multiple times in different vertebrate groups. Um, there's an early archosaur called Arizonasaurus that kind of has a sail, Oh, and Spinosaurus as well, God damn it! how the hell did I remember Arizonasaurus, but not Spinosaurus? Spinosaurus as well has that sail, and I think there are some living lizards, like some chameleons, have a very short uh, sail-like feature as well. It's cute though, like, you know, it's enjoying exploring its new home. Actually, no way, hang on, oh my god! <laughs> so this mod has taught me that Early amphibians are basically just really naughty little monsters, and that's all they seem to be able to do is escape and find holes in the things I've built for them. And then finally, one last carboniferous beastie for today, this is Follida Peton. This one's especially close to home for me because it wandered around the northeast of England 320 million years before my house was built there. This animal is still an amphibian, but it is not a Temnospondyli, so I kind of lied earlier. It actually belongs to a group called the Embola Mirrors, a clade of very large carnivorous amphibians. Now, we're very confident that their lineage is completely extinct, which finally begs the question, where did modern amphibians like frogs and newts arise from? Now, over the next couple of episodes, we're going to be talking about how other tetrapods like mammals and reptiles evolved, so I don't really want to jump ahead and overcomplicate the story. At some point in the future, I would really like to come back to Temnospondyli and amphibians in general, because... I personally know very, very little about them. Early tetrapods I am pretty comfortable with, but when we start to get into these gritty details, it's not an area I know a lot about, so I think I'm going to have to try and track down, go through my sort of contacts, and find a Temnospondyli expert so we can talk about their inevitable possible extinction in the Permian, and a whole bunch of other stuff, because I don't know, and like I said, I don't want to mess up the story any further. So let's stay focused for now on the evolution of ourselves and our own evolutionary story. Anyway, we're now done with them. Amphibians were well underway, and although they were still so strange and diverse compared to their living counterparts like toads and frogs and newts, unfortunately how we got from these early amphibians, from making occasional trips onto land to these totally terrestrial tetrapods by the Permian, is obscured by one of several gaps in the fossil record. I believe it's called Roma's Gap, Basically, there's this sudden absence of fossils about 370 million years ago at a really crucial time in vertebrate evolution. Some people have suggested that there may have been a mass extinction event, others suggest that there may have been some change in the environment, like the climate, that physically and chemically reduced the chances of fossilization happening. All we know is that full-time land vertebrates just emerged on the other side of the gap and hopefully one day we'll find fossils to plug in that space. Paleontology is often like this. I once described it as like trying to follow the plot of a TV show, except you're watching it with no sound through your neighbor's window and only when they have the curtains open. 
like every now and again you might miss a really important episode and now half the cast are dead. That's exactly what it's like. So anyway, amphibians, much like today, they are limited to a partial life in the water. <laughs> I think what I mean to say is, like, any idiot can evolve legs. If you want to commit to a life on land, you've got to be prepared to be born on land. And that, I think, looking at the time, is what we're going to cover in the next episode. So I will see you then.